All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast, episode number 200. I cannot believe we hit this milestone with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach and a very special guest today, David Garfinkel. David, how you doing, man? Woohoo, I'm so excited. Number 200. I'm excited as well. And we have a guest today that has ties to something that we've mentioned in every single episode of the podcast so far. I would say so. Um, let's jump right into it. You know, we all need a lawyer sometimes. Uh, but haven't you ever thought, wouldn't it be great if there were a lawyer devoted to copywriters and other creative professionals, not only that, but she put together customizable contracts and terms of service and things like that for people like us. Ever thought I of anything? Thought that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have two pieces of good news for you. There is such a person. Her name is Amy Neesom, Neesheim. And secondly, she is our special guest today, and she will give us some important information about copywriting and the law. Not only that, not only that, but I'm going to see if I can talk her into giving me her response to something you should already be very familiar with. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health and finance and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So Amy, welcome and, and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah. So how is that disclaimer anyway? Uh, it's really not that bad. <laughs> Uh, surprisingly that's high praise from a lawyer really not that bad surprisingly. <laughs> yeah um you know you think about like those disclaimers at like a carnival or something where it says ride this ride at your own risk uh -huh. and so you know that it was put together in two hours by someone being paid minimum wage and as a fully competent adult you can make that decision for yourself uh, whether to get on that rickety ride or not. And that's basically what you're saying. You know, this take this information at your own risk and use it as you will. And then you're, you're responsible for it. And yeah, you know, that's really all you need to say. <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, the copywriters podcast pays me nothing. So I did write it at minimum wage. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, let's talk about you for a second. Then I want to get into the a long arm of the law. Um, how did you get here? I mean, why aren't you putting on a suit and carrying a briefcase to your corporate job anymore? I feel like that answer is self-explanatory. I mean, who wants to put on a suit, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's how I look at it. Yeah, but really, I worked in a law firm for two years um, doing general corporate business type stuff, helping small businesses around my state of New Hampshire. Um, and I really felt like it wasn't feeding my creative drive. And it also wasn't necessarily serving clients in the best way that I felt like was possible. Um, because small business owners have such a variety of needs and they have small resources and, you know, doing an hourly uh, fee and not knowing exactly how much of that is going to add up to it. I felt like it really wasn't serving clients in the best way possible. And it wasn't like, aligning with my vision of what I wanted for my future. I, I love that. So it sounds like you liked your clients, you liked the work, but you didn't really like the business structure of working in a law firm and, you know, just mm -hmm. having an open-ended budget for them to spend. Yes. And uh, New Hampshire is a very white state, a very old state. And by old, I mean all of the people in it are old. So like the average age of a lawyer in New Hampshire is probably 60. And that was like not meshing with me at all. <laughs> um, and they are just like really resistant to modernizing in any way. And I feel like that was just not meshing with the entrepreneurial spirit, not like actually helping people move forward in their businesses. Well, um, good point. And, you know, you, you have something that's a lot more in tune with the times and probably a lot friendlier. And, and we'll talk about that a little later on. But mm -hmm. let's let's talk. I'm, I'm sure, you know, you're 
you're in the entrepreneurial community, you see what copywriters do. Just in, in the greater scheme of things, what kind of mistakes do you see copywriters and, and business owners making with their copy? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's really easy for business owners and especially new copywriters or you know people really excited to have a client to just get really excited about sharing the product that's been created and they want people to uh, resonate with it. They want people to buy it and they end up focusing too much on convincing the audience of how great it is um, and focusing too much on whether it converts and not enough on whether they're actually delivering on what they promise and whether the copy meshes with what the product is actually about. Yeah. That's the biggest conflict I see. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Don't play one on this podcast, but I, I look at it the same way. Uh, You know, a lot of what we talk about here is take some time to think about your customer, think about the product, think about what it actually can do that you can improve. I mean, I know there are all kinds of fine tuned nuances um, mm-hmm. that maybe we'll get into a little bit, but uh, we're definitely on the same page with that. My clients often get, especially the larger ones, they do get a legal review of the work done. Um, I have clients who own businesses and clients who write for large businesses, but if the client's getting a legal review of the work done, do copywriters really need to worry about this? I mean, Whose responsibility is it to make sure in compliance these days, wow, there's the private um, world of compliance rules like Facebook and Google. And then, of course, there's the alphabet agency world like DOJ, FTC, FDA, SEC, and Mm -hmm. state AG, all those things. I mean, whose responsibility is it to make sure the copy is legally compliant? Yeah, that is a great question um, because I think it can be pretty easy for a copywriter, copywriter to think like, well, I'm not the one putting this out there. It's really up to the business owner to decide if it's true or to look it over and um, make sure it follows all the laws. But that's not actually the case. Um, so the FTC has the lawmakers basically decided they wanted to prevent this like hot potato of responsibility. And so they put it on the business owner, the person actually selling the product and also on the marketer. So someone who is putting out an advertisement, the person writing the advertisement is also legally responsible for making sure that the copy and you know the design and the images as well all comply with the law and are not deceptive or unfair to the consumer. And so copywriters working for an agency might be more insulated from this either because of their contract or because um, the agency are really, they're more focused on protecting their copywriters because they want to make sure that they can do good work. Um, And big businesses might also have their own compliance team or hire their own lawyers, like you had said. And so copywriters working in those situations might be more insulated from it and not have to worry about it as much. But for small business uh, copywriters who write for entrepreneurs or small businesses who don't have this at top of mind really need to be cognizant of the rules and making sure that they're being honest and following all the regulations in their copy. And that responsibility is on both parties. Okay. That's, that's fair. And that's good information to know. So I want to I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent and talk about a legal concept I've heard of, which maybe you could discuss. And it's, um, I think, before um, sexism started to recede, it was called the reasonable man theory. And now mm-hmm. I think maybe it's called the reasonable person theory. The way I understand it, and, and I'm really glad for you to correct me if I'm wrong or add to it or, or confirm it if I happen to get it right, is that if you make a promise or a statement about something and it is, and a judge, I guess, essentially could say, well, a reasonable person would, could be deceived, could be exploited, taken advantage of um, to their detriment by this, then that kind of goes against the whole reasonable person idea. Is that true? Is that about right? Yep, you nailed it. And I am really glad you brought that up. (laughs) Yeah, so the standard is what would the 
reasonable consumer, the person purchasing the product, what would they believe based on what you've said? And so it's not what you think that you're communicating or what your intentions are that matter when you're writing the copy. It's the person reading it and actually thinking about buying the product, considering investing. Um, this is going to get a little gross, but this is a copywriter's podcast after all. Um, when I see that commercial on TV where the bears are using toilet paper, um, they're not really in any kind of trouble, right? Because no one believes that bears would use toilet paper or, or if they would, they wouldn't like, you know, um, I don't know, interact. You know, they'd just probably eat it or tear it apart. Or something. <laughs> it's more like if, if you're doing some kind of, I don't know, weight loss thing and you say you can lose 10 pounds in three days with absolutely no ill harm effects, you know, harm health effects. I mean, it's, it's the specific claims that seem very real and specific. Am I on the right track there? Yes. Uh, so there's one thing I wanted to bring up about this though, because a reason, a reasonable person can be kind of ridiculous. So Red Bull actually got in trouble a few years ago uh, for their campaign, Red Bull Gives You Wings, because someone sued them saying, I didn't grow wings from drinking Red Bull and I've been drinking it for 10 years and nothing has changed. <laughs> and so we don't actually know the outcome of that because Red Bull just settled, just decided to pay money instead of going through the court process. Oh. But <laughs> so but so it was that's also interesting. The, so what you and I, and or what a marketer thinks is a reasonable person might not describe all consumers. I mean, I think mm -hmm. we, we've all found people who are not being reasonable, but maybe a court would say, well, yeah, that person is um, a, few, a few fries short of a Happy Meal, but they're <laughs> reasonable. Yeah, and also there's implied claims that go along with that. So it doesn't only matter what you exactly say word for word, it also matters what you're suggesting. So in that case, um, giving you wings could mean making you run faster or, and those are the things that they had implied in their commercials. And so that person was saying, well, I'm not any faster of a runner than I was when I started drinking Red Bull. So I, I doubt this would, you know, be relevant in court, but I know a lot of people have dreams about flying. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't, for some reason, I, I don't, I like to stay close to the ground. I, I don't remember my dreams, but mine are probably about being a turtle or a lizard, you know, but it could be possible that if you have something that people vividly imagine as one of your claims, even if it's not reasonable, that you, you just got to be, I guess you're saying you got to be careful, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what you were saying before about, you know, the specificity of a claim is absolutely true. So the more specific you are in saying, you know, lose 10 pounds in three days, the more um, scrutiny you fall under for, for saying things like that. So okay. if it's more general, then it's, it's safer. Well, let's, let's uh, transition into that whole thing. What kinds of claims, obviously specific, but can, can you give us some other pointers on the kinds of claims copywriters need to be concerned with, even if they don't work in a highly regulated industry like health or finance or business opportunity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's claims in all copy, right? So the first thing I would like to say is that, you know, a slogan can be a claim like Red Bull gives you wings. It's not a statement in a sales page, but it is something that the consumer is hearing about the product. And it can also be the product name. Like if you have a product that's called uh, the 90 days to 100K program, that could still be a claim that that person, when they invest in your program, is going to make $100,000 in 90 days. Wait, what, what was that crashing sound I heard? The entire biz op industry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so things like that, that um, just basically promises, if you're making promises or if you're making statements that say these are the results that you can get or you can expect to achieve, then that is something that you need to examine. Okay. Do, do you have any, any examples or, or stories either with your own clients or things you've seen or heard about of, of, of other claims like that? I mean, I love the Red Bull story. That was really good. Mm -hmm. Um. The thing that comes to mind often when I think about what copywriters and marketers, especially in the online space, are doing is 
price claims. So when you say this course is worth X amount of money, but you get it at a discounted price, that's something we see absolutely everywhere. Everyone's doing it. Entrepreneurs are selling courses you know, on how to price your course. And they say, have a 10 X value stack and have these bonuses and stuff. And that can actually cause a lot of problems because if you've never actually sold the course at this high price that you're quoting on your sales page as this normal price, the regular price, then that is deceptive marketing. And so if you call it, if you say it's 90% off of the regular price, then it's, it's a lie because you haven't sold it at that before. Of course, there are probably sneaky workarounds that would, would get you through a loophole, right? I mean, I could, I could write an ebook called, um, I don't know, How to Substitute Green Tea for Coffee, for example. And, um, and I could put it up a web page for a month um, and sell it for $1,000. And mm-hmm. I might get, um, I don't know, somewhere between zero and zero sales. And then um, I could then offer it for $9.99 and say, this is, you know, $990 and one cent off. And that would fit at least fit the definition of not um, inflating the value because just because I didn't make any sales doesn't mean that I didn't sell it at that price at one, or try to sell it at that price at one point. Yeah. But there's also the argument that a, re- a reasonable consumer would never buy it for that price. So is that actually a value that you can ascribe to it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good point. And I'm, I'm not arguing in favor of it, just sort of ex- testing the claims. Mm-hmm. What, what do you see on, on sales pages besides um, these kind of claims that could be problematic in your opinion? Yeah. So there's the price is a big thing. And part of something that goes along with that is bonuses. If you have something that you say is free, it needs to actually be free. You can't use that to bump up the price of the base product. And I think people sneak in that stuff all the time. So mm-hmm. if, if I'm selling this, um, uh, you know, ebook on, on coffee and green tea, and then I say, uh, you know, here's, here's a list of where you can get the best green tea at the best price. Um, it's worth uh, $50, but I'm giving you to you free. As long as I'm not raising the base price of the offer, I'm not in trouble. It's, it's mm-hmm. free, but it, it, it's actually part of a package where the price goes from nine ninety nine to nineteen ninety nine. Then, and you know, I mean, to me, this is common sense, but I'm not out there in the marketplace, um, you know, dealing with every single person, every single offer. Um, people, people do think differently, right? And yeah. you make some big mistakes. And I think this is really common in the online course space because the numbers are pretty arbitrary. Like the value is something that the course creator made up in their head. And I think it can be easy to end up fudging the numbers a little bit and without even doing it intentionally. But it's not the intention that matters. Okay. So um, I, I guess um, there are more minefields out there for copywriters than uh, I thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what can a copywriter do to protect themselves from all this liability? Mm-hmm. Um, there's three things that I would recommend. First is have a good contract. Um, so some of this liability you can pour onto the business owner or your agency that you're working for, um, either with an indemnification clause, which means that the business owner will defend you if something comes up and that they will accept the responsibility or a limitation of liability clause, which says you're the maximum amount that you're responsible for is capped at a certain number. Now I will have to say that both of these are limited in that they don't always work. So if you, as a copywriter, say something ridiculous, like this, take this pill and you'll grow three inches overnight, like you know that that's not true. And in that case, the intentionality of it can get you in trouble because there's no, it's not negligence, it's recklessness basically at that point. So have it in your contract and don't do anything don't do anything dumb. <laughs> Don't do anything dumb. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then the, then the second way is to form a business entity. So 
um, an LLC can create a layer of protection that separates your personal assets from your business assets. So if you do end up getting sued or have fines for your writing or advertising, then only your business assets are at risk. Okay. And the third way is uh, to get insurance, errors and emissions insurance. And I don't actually know how common that is for copywriters to do. I think working for an agency, it might not be as relevant, but maybe you would know better than me. If- well, my girlfriend is an insurance expert and it's one of the first things she made me buy. So um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, but I, I have a friend who does. So um, I, I want to tell a story about one of your products. You may not even know. I okay. have, have a friend who had a situation where she had to put up a web page in record time Mm -hmm. and um, it was going to be looked at by Google and it needed to have terms of service. And so she went to this website and got a terms of service package, put it in there, boom, done the same day. That happened to be your website. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. Um, and it's called Artful Contracts. I'd love for you to talk to us about Artful Contracts. Tell us what it is, what it can do, what it can't do. Sure. So uh, my business is called Artful Contracts. I have a website where I sell templated legal documents. So that includes things like website policies, uh, terms of purchase, if you're selling something which is different than terms of service, and also um, contracts for service providers like copywriters, uh, graphic designers, things like that. And so these are templated documents that you can then customize to your business. And I'm not selling legal advice and I'm not like, I can't customize it for you, but it gives you a really great starting place if you don't have the time or money to go hire a lawyer to draft something custom for you. Okay. And uh, that's at artfulcontracts.com. Yep. Could you go through them again? What are the different types of documents that you sell? Mm-hmm. I have a terms of um, terms and conditions for your website, a pro- GDPR compliant privacy policy for your website, uh, disclaimers for your website, and terms of purchase if you're selling digital products or online courses. I also have um, service provider agreements, so copywriter, um, like freelancers, anybody who is selling done for you services. I have. Uh, template agreements for them, also consulting or coaching, and things for running your LLC. I have an LLC bundle that has an operating agreement and some other documents that help you actually run your LLC properly. Okay, that's really good. Uh, Nathan, you've been quiet as a church mouse. Do you have any any questions for Amy? This is a subject that I'm very interested in. I think all copywriters should take it serious. And, and uh, so I've been kind of just sitting here and absorbing. Amy, you mentioned the GDPR and I wanted to get your thoughts on in different countries, there's different restrictions. I know that in certain European countries, you're not allowed to advertise a dishwasher specifically to women because it might offend some people or you're not allowed to uh, advertise certain things to people based off of their weight. Um, and a lot of business now is done internationally. We might have a business set up in America, but we might have customers and clients throughout the world. How important is it to have legal teams from other countries or legal experts from other countries reviewing your copy and, and your marketing? Is that something that should be a concern? Is that something that's going to be a growing concern in your opinion in the future? Yeah, that is a really great question. I think it's definitely going to be a growing issue. Um, And if you can afford it, I would say always get a lawyer to check it out because it, it's like, it's like going to the doctor, right? So if you go for your preventative visits every year, then you save a ton of money compared to all of a sudden you have something terrible happen because you weren't having those checkups and then you're paying for an ambulance ride and an ER visit. And so it can happen very similarly with a lawyer. So if you actually pay for Uh, someone to review things preventatively, then you save a ton of money as compared to all of a sudden you're being sued and you have 10 different countries, agencies fining you for a violation that you could have prevented. 
Okay. Thank you. And one more time before we're out of here, where can people go to find more of your work? Artfulcontracts.com. And you can find me on social at Artful Contracts. Awesome. David, anything else before we're out of here? No, just thank you, Amy. This is really good. And I feel so relieved about the disclaimer after your blessing. <laughs> it was great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And until next time, if you want to get more of your copywriters fix, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com and we will catch you later. Catch you later.